everybody. Welcome to Apocalypse Here, Christianity You Can Live With. Um, thanks for tuning in to this uh, episode. This is going to be our fourth uh, audience question episode. This question comes in from uh, Spartan Theology. Shout out to Spartan Theology for this uh, question. Uh, the question is really, how do we understand natural theology? In a, in a previous exchange with, with Spartan via text, he was asking about Bart's kind of approach to you. So I'm going to do a little bit of both because I agree with Bart quite a lot on this and on other things, obviously. Um, but I'm going to talk about kind of Bart's approach and then talk about some of my own concerns um, from uh, that have come from other theologians and scholars who are skeptical of natural theology and what, what worries me about natural theology. The reason why Bart came up is because he's kind of the most famous uh, for opposing natural theology. Um, <laughs> in the uh, 20th century. But in his last volume of the Church Dogmatics, Church Dogmatics, Bard actually develops a kind of natural theology of his own. He calls it secular parables of the kingdom. So we'll talk a little bit about that and about whether or not kind of Bart flip-flopped on natural revelation throughout his life once he got a bit older. Did his mature thought lead him to accept it eventually? Um, so we're gonna talk a bit about that. And then I'll give some of my um, thoughts on this as well that may make some of you who are watching this a bit unhappy so just know that in advance i understand <laughs> so what is car what is natural theology as defined by bart so bart in church dogmatics 2 1 says natural theology is the doctrine of union of man with god existing outside of god's revelation in jesus christ so for bart it's it's possible to discern scientific and mathematic and philosophical truths through the study of the natural world, but knowledge of God isn't actually ascertained in this way. And I've talked about this a lot. It's it's really something that's revealed concretely in Jesus. The natural world isn't really a source of a natural revelation in which anybody can discern a kind of natural theology independent of God's self-revelation in Jesus. So any natural theology for Bart that's based on a so-called natural revelation isn't really a revelation at all because it's grounded in self-evident truths discerned in nature apart from the revelation, which is Jesus, that apocalypse that happens in him. So he rejects everything that starts somewhere else and builds an account of theology from there. And one of those um, enemies for him was natural theology. So here's a, another quote from Bart in CD21. One would think that nothing could be simpler or more obvious than the insight that a theology which makes a great show of guaranteeing the knowability of God apart from grace and therefore from faith, and then thinks and promises that is able to give such guarantee, in other words, a natural theology, it is quite impossible within the, within the church, and indeed, in such a way that it cannot even be discussed in principle. And natural theology can be talked about in various ways. So we, we hear it talked about in terms of general revelation, as against specific revelation, common grace, nature and grace, things like that. But Bart's rejecting all of these. But why does Bart do this? And we're going to need to do a little bit of historical analysis to see um, how Bart kind of develops his thinking about this and why he rejects it so, um, so harshly. So in 1932, in the very beginning of the, the dogmatics, actually in the preface of 1-1, the first thing Bart says is that so-called natural theology, natural knowledge of God, is the invention of the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a little bit harsh. Bart taught that there's no knowledge of God apart from the self-revelation of God alone in Jesus Christ. Any other source of revelation is strictly rejected as natural revelation, which is no revelation at all. And any kind of natural theology based on that false revelation is going to be rejected too by Bart. Um, there's no sort of theology from below is another way to put this for Bart, where knowledge of, of God is obtained by way of observing like rocks, right? In the natural world or, or triangles from mathematics. Um, anything apart from, as Bart would say, the name above all names, Jesus is going to be rejected as giving us the truth about God in a, um, in a trustworthy way. And then we move on a couple of years later, Emil Brunner wrote Nature and Grace, um, where he's allowing for a kind of limited natural theology. Bart writes a rebuke that's just titled Nein, which is German for no. 
and then gives a, a kind of angry introduction to that. It literally calls an, called it an angry introduction. This correspondence in 1934 between Bruner and Bart has become pretty famous. So I don't know if those of you who turned in tuned into uh, uh, Mark Gammon's discussion um, on theology and depression, but he brought up Bruner and Bart's exchange and, and said that at Boston College, where, he, where uh, it's a Catholic school, they use this exchange to kind of poke fun at Bart and uh, the sort of apocalyptic stuff that Bart was doing. And then um, in my classes with Gammon, we use the piece to kind of poke fun at uh, people who endorse natural theology. So it's funny how this text can be used in different ways. But in that exchange, um, it was actually so vicious that it ended their friendship pretty much for the rest of their lives. There's a, there may be an, ex an exception to that that I'll talk about, but this was really, really personal for them. Lots of people have criticized Bart for the way that he responded and, and all of that and the way that this ended a friendship. But I think we need to realize that Bart's no to Brunner is really a no to the German Christians in Nazi Germany. It has a broader target. The Reich Church essentially called Hitler's Mein Kampf um, another source of revelation alongside, or another witness to revelation alongside the Bible. Um, so Bart's protest against natural theology was also a protest against the Nazi claim uh, to be a revelation of God. And I'll talk about this more later on when I'm giving my own kind of response to this. Um, Bart protested against all such forms of natural revelation, especially, especially the Nazi kind, um, in his contribution to the Barman Declaration in 1934. Here's a little snippet from it. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation, apart from and besides the one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths as God's revelation. And then we move to 1940. Bart kind of doubles down on what he was he's committed to in terms of rejecting natural revelation. He silences uh, appeals to divine nature in Romans 120, which is really interesting. Um, Psalm 19, uh, 140, Job 38 to 40, texts like that. So he really stands firm on this. But once you get to 1959, quite later on, two decades later, um, in the final complete volume of the Church Dogmatics in four. 3.1, Bart kind of surprised people um, by developing what seems like a kind of a natural theology um, that he calls the secular parables of the kingdom. Bart now appears to affirm what he, 25 years earlier, clearly rejected. Seems to. Um, so people were accusing Bart of, of kind of uh, flip-flopping on this. Um, Jürgen Moltmann is one uh, scholar who later on uh, kind of uh, charged Bart with that. But think about this for a second. 15 years had passed since Nazi, Nazi Germany was uh, in its ruin, really. Uh, so the political situation had changed in post-World War II Germany. Church Dogmatics 4 3.1 was written at a time that Bart could kind of talk about these things without kind of Nazis overhead, right? So he wasn't really thinking that um, anymore. And then in 1966... Brunner was on his deathbed, and Bart made an attempt to actually reconcile with him by writing him a letter. Um, don't really know if this actually got to Brunner, if he read this before he died or not, but it says, if he, Brunner, is still alive and it is possible, tell him I commend him to our God, and tell him the time that I thought I should say no to him is long since past, and we all live only by the fact that a great and merciful God speaks his gracious yes to all of us. Beautiful. Um attempt at reconciliation with Brunner after their friendship really ended. So what does Bart mean by secular parables of the kingdom? So Jürgen Moltmann, years later, provided a really helpful summary, I think, of Bart's account of secular parables. This is, quote, at the end of his church dogmatics, Bart developed his own natural theology after the special Christian theology. There can and must be a theology of nature about the many lights outside of the one light of Christ and the many words of truth outside of the one word of the incarnate of God, which is Christ. But the relationship between the light, which is Christ, and the many lights of this world is like a rear reflector in your car. If you switch on the lights of your car, then you can see the reflectors of the car in front of you. So the lights in nature are only a reflection of the light of Christ. They do not illuminate anything themselves, only a reflection of the light of Christ. So by, by secular, Bart 
really is referring to the those other lights. So that's why he's using that language. Um, that aren't generating any sort of light, but are reflecting the light of Christ in the world. Another way to talk about this would be in terms of they're mediating God's word. So through other lights in the world, other truths in the world, Christ's truth can be mediated and reflected. So what does he mean by parables? So he kind of steps beyond the, the reflection kind of image here by using this language of parable or parables. Uh, Jesus used parables obviously, as we know in his teaching, so that those who have faith would understand and those who did not have faith, so the religious teachers, a lot of times in context, would not understand. So Matthew 13, 13 is a good example of that. So what does Bart mean by parable when he says secular parables of the kingdom? Bart explains that a parable is based on an ordinary human happening that has no significance on its own, such as when we engage in a mundane activity, like going to work, eating food, driving a car, something like that. These activities may be observable by anyone. Anyone can see me driving a car, um, eating, right? Going for a walk, going to the store. So they're observable activities and are not revelations of God at all, but they have the capacity to reflect the self-revelation to people through faith. So these mundane activities can become the sorts of reflections that kind of uh, shine Christ's light into the world, even the most mundane activities. One of the tricky things about Bart here is that he doesn't actually give examples of secular parables. <laughs> in healthy. So Bart's actually unwilling to provide any secular parables uh, and actually ends up criticizing Zwingli for doing th just that. Uh, so this kind of leads us to think, is Bart really not accepting natural theology? at all at this point? Is he just kind of gesturing towards something that's a possibility? Um, kind of, yeah. Um, he's saying that it is possible that things in the world, even the most mundane things, can reflect Christ and mediate his revelation. But listen to what he says here. <laughs> in conclusion, it is to be noted that surprising though it may seem, in our whole development of the problem of these other words, or these other lights, we, we have not adduced a single example, nor quoted a single name, nor mentioned an event or trend or movement, nor referred to a, a new and singular or common general phenomenon, political, social, intellectual, academic, artistic, literary, moral, or religious life, to which there might be ascribed a character of a true word of this kind, as distinct from Zwingli, who appealed to Hercules, um, Socrates, Cicero, and others, uh, we have deliberately refrained from doing so. And I think Bart's deliberately refraining from doing this because the revelation needs to be coming under the control of the freedom of God. We can't sort of point to a place and say, ah, this is where God's going to reveal himself um, as uh, mediated by this thing. This is where Christ is going to show up for sure. Bart's really all about the freedom of God in this way. And that's why he's actually refraining from doing it. He's not saying it's not going to happen or doesn't happen or hasn't happened. This is where I think his concerns about Nazism sort of remain. He's not willing to point to a political system, an intellectual system, an academic system, or anything like that to say, yeah, this is where God's showing up. So does Bart actually end up affirming a natural theology? Not really. No, um, <laughs> he doesn't. His parables of the kingdom do seem very different uh, because he's he's talking about them in, them in terms of a reflection of Christ and Christ's revelation. So there's nothing in nature for him or in other words or in other truths that are conveying something on their own. I generally agree with Bart's approach, especially concerning the uh, deriving the truth about God from some other place than the way God has chosen to reveal himself most fully in the incarnation of Jesus and by way of the Spirit. Although my concern is less with natural revelation becoming, um, sometimes he puts it like becoming a second Bible. I think this is where Bart goes a little bit biblicist. Um, even though he does talk about the Bible as a witness, I think he... I wouldn't want to contrast the natural revelation with the Bible. Um, I would contrast it with Christ specifically. Um, so I'm not too worried about it becoming an, another Bible. Um, my concern really has to do with the methodological starting point of natural theology and what flows from that when we begin our theological task. One way of thinking about this in kind of broader terms is using the term foundationalism. And this is where Douglas Campbell's work is actually going to be really helpful. Foundationalism denotes our provision of a different foundation for truth from the one that God has laid out for us in Christ. And so it, it's a structure that we ultimately build for ourselves. 
foundationalism has also has a more technical kind of usage um, in modern philosophical discourse. Some of you sort of philosophically minded might know this, um, referring primarily to the desire of many thinkers in sort of post Descartes philosophy to construct a, uh, a really solid basis for knowledge, a foundation um, in this specific sense. It's really an indubitable basis. So clearly there's an overlap here between these uses. Um, so any such philosophical attempt to construct a perfect foundation for all thought and knowledge is a form of foundationalism. In the light of, of Christ's revelation of the triune God, we can see this kind of as an exercise of human hubris. <laughs> um, and it happens in a lot of forms. And I see natural theology as seeking to construct a foundation for thought and knowledge on the basis of self-evident truths discernible from the cosmos. So I see it as a kind of foundationalism. What's kind of frustrating for me is we don't need to do this. We don't need to go there. <laughs> we don't need to go to natural theology. We, we, we Christians located by the word of God within the central truth that explains all of reality, we already have the truth. Um, nature is a way that can mediate God's truth to us in various ways, um, as God wills to do so. Um, so we can give an account of nature that's that's totally consistent with Christ's revelation. But the weird thing to me is starting there as Christians. Why step out of the circle of revelation into another location to construct a truth system? <laughs> I don't think we, we help ourselves, and I don't really think we help our interlocutors when we do so we actually kind of begin losing our particularity as Christians when we attempt to embrace an alternative account of truth. And in this process, I think we do our interlocutors a disservice because they're no longer in contact with something really authentically Christological and Christian, okay? And I think we run the risk here of launching into a kind of infinite regress at the basis of our thinking. Let's say we succeed somehow, in finding another truth criterion that can judge our key claims about the revelation of God in Christ. And I, I would uh, really uh, encourage you to go back and watch the video on Christian truth that I put out. I think it was the first video that I put out on this channel, because um, that's going to give a sense of where I'm coming from in terms of truth, although some of this is going to come through. Truth is a revelation of Jesus Christ that comes under the control, the control of Jesus Christ, and it's a, a self-attesting truth. Jesus is the truth and reveals it in his arrival. So there's no sort of measure outside of that that can validate it as true, okay? Uh, because it's God. <laughs> It'd be weird if we Christians could um, erect something above God to judge him and to judge his existence and truth. Um, I don't really wanna go there. So let's say we find this other truth criteria and we start to try to evaluate um, the truth about God and Christ. Once we step back from this, we need to ask ourselves how we know this latest criteria is true. We're going to need another one, another criteria to judge that criteria that we had set up. But then, of course, we're going to need another one to make sure that that one is true. And away we go. And I think it's important to, to know that everyone really starts somewhere um, in their thinking about truth. So at which point we, we need to see that ultimately everyone's basis of truth um, in their truth criteria is self-authenticating. And this is something that Aristotle made clear a long time ago in posterior analytics. No one can actually prove the basis of their truth. If they think they can, then this sort of infinite regress comes in. We can't actually demonstrate that our truth is true. I don't think anybody can. So I think we're actually pretty entitled to start with the revelation of Jesus as the Lord and to claim its self-authenticating arrival, which I talked about in the truth video. And God for, for Christians seems to be a pretty good place to locate self-authentication. <laughs> so I think it's a good place to start. Um, but if we take up natural theology and it's kind of foundationalism, what's so bad about that? There are a few issues. The first is that these other foundations like natural theology, if, if, I think they inevitably collapse under closer scrutiny. As far as I know, no universally demonstrable criteria for truth has ever been derived successfully that can withstand philosophical scrutiny, whether by Christians or Jews or by non-Christians. I'm not denying the presence of insights, insights and fragments of truth and bursts of inspiration within the accumulated thinking of, of humans, in, especially in the philosophical discussion. 
again, parables of the kingdom here. I think that there are ways that Christ's truth can shine through those things. But I'm not aware of, of an independent and objectively derived and demonstrated truth criterion that successfully leads to God. Not one. So I really fear that when Christians think that they can prove the existence of God acting in Jesus independently of God's self-revelation, using some higher truth or argument or position that everyone can sort of see and acknowledge, they're going to pay a heavy price for that. These can be convincing to those who are already Christians, but they tend to collapse under the scrutiny of modern philosophy. And a, a culture that's been told loudly that God can be proved then feels justified in turning away from God, and understandably so. God is rejected as an unproved hypothesis without anyone confronting the place where God has in fact chosen to become known, which is personally in Jesus Christ. So the rejection of God makes sense in response to foundationalism, and I think in response to natural theology. But the, the, a foundationalist approach like natural theology also tends to obstruct us from ever reaching the truth about God that really matters, Jesus Christ. If we try to press on boldly from our foundation of self-evident truths about God discerned from the cosmos, we end up with something like the God of the philosophers, right? And this is because we construct our foundation by deriving some universal principle or dynamic from our own reality as our truth criteria. And then we extrapolate and develop our truth in a way that will hopefully lead to God. And our key principle will have to be something very broad and universal and abstract. It needs to be sensible to everybody across space and time. We're going to be reflecting on the inner nature of all reality in terms of an essence or on the, the sense that we often judge things to be, to be beautiful or not, or on the inner logic of, of history or something like that. But our conclusions are going to be a long way away from the recognition that God was fully present in a Jewish person who was shamefully executed around 30 CE. We find and worship the God who is the essence of all reality or beauty or history or whatever else we've managed to infer from it, which is pretty different than Christ. I think by supposing this is the way to, to truth, I think, in all good conscience, we actually oppose those who try to approach it in other ways, including, and perhaps especially opposing, the poor people who simply claim that Jesus Christ is the Lord and attribute that claim to the Lord. So like the Corinthians, right? Moreover, we have probably invested so much time and effort in developing our big truth system that we'll be reluctant to abandon it. And if we really think that our belief in God depends on this system, we're going to be even more reluctant to abandon it. So I get why it's hard to step away from this kind of approach. But unfortunately, the end result of this will be the determined obstruction of the very truth that we're supposed to be reaching and proclaiming, that God was fully present in Jesus and, and speaks this truth to us through the Holy Spirit and takes up all sorts of forms of mediation to do so. But by virtue of starting and constructing our system from another position, we will block the way to that very objective that we're supposed to be trying to establish, which is, of course, counterproductive. And one last thing I'm going to say on this. This may be a little hard to um, accept. When we build our systems foundationally, we'll have to project some aspect of ourselves into God's location. So we'll probably isolate and extend something that we take to be especially impressive about humanity or our situation. But these projections are never innocent. They are projections by a particular group of people, specific cities, cultures, locales, and usually by well-educated white men. So there's actually nothing universal or self-evident about the basis of natural theology at all. The inevitable result of these projections is a subtle self-ratification of those leaders and their culture. We can't help affirming ourselves fundamentally within these systems. We're just going to do it. But we need to call this what it is, this sort of building God in our own image. It's idolatry. We end up actually affirming our culture. We thereby remove from judgment all those aspects of it that God might be speaking to us about when we grasp that he is revealed in Christ. When the truth about God is a gift of God, 
Every aspect of our life is brought under its lordship and correction and healing. When the truth about God is a projection, parts of our identity are permanently reserved from judgment. And the result of this can be horrific. And this is, of course, going to link back to Bart's concern about National Socialism. Like I was talking about with the 1930s, about 90% of German Protestants believed that Adolf Hitler was a leader who had been sent by God to restore the pride of the German nation and to further its mission within broader Christendom. These church leaders had strayed from God's self-revelation in Christ and turned to philosophical and cultural projections of one sort or the other. As Bart saw with astute clarity, really, these projections cloaked in sinister political and cultural self ratifications ultimately involved the church in deep confusion and failures. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who is not an apocalyptic thinker is a Nazi. <laughs> I'm simply saying that we need to see historically that the stakes are really high here. We need to be vigilant about accepting seemingly innocent alternative starting points and systems and trust the one that we've been graciously given by Christ who is the Lord of all space and time and truth. Thank you for watching this audience response video. Um, number four um, on natural theology. I hope you learned something. I'm guessing you were probably frustrated by something. Um, so feel free to leave a comment in uh, the section below or contact me on Twitter or anything like that. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Um, thank you for tuning in. And with that, this has been Apocalypse Here, Christianity You Can Live With. Sorry.